I would like to thank Dr. Hirschfeld for running this symposium and for, uh, and I want to thank BBRF and NASA for this fantastic uh, privilege. I'm uh, deeply honored by receiving this year's LIBA together with my friend and colleague, Anissa Abidaka. So, um, oops. You can hear me well, I hope. So good. So, so the type of work I'm primarily focusing on for a quarter century now, so for 25 years, is um, to do the best we can with the technology available at any given point in time to understand the molecular pathology operating in a brain of a person diagnosed with schizophrenia. Right? So we probably all believe schizophrenia is a brain disease, there is a biological signature in it, and if it's biology, if it's cell biology, it must have some molecular dysregulation on the protein or RNA level or gene level, or probably all of them together. So that is, that is in some ways a very basic tenet. And it is easier said than done, meaning explored, um, when you talk about brain tissue, because brain is obviously not accessible, so you are limited to studying postmortem brain. And that has been greatly hampered the field. And when we started this work in the early 90s, this was a time when even the top journals primarily published papers that were nissel stains, the kind of stains that already Alois Alzheimer's 100 years ago had conducted to study his Alzheimer's and also uh, some cases with, with psychosis back then. So it's really very difficult to, to um, overcome some of these technical obstacles. But we said, and, and together with colleagues, it's not just me, but a whole bunch of scientists, that we're not shying away from this challenge. And let's just try whatever technique is out there and try to apply to postmortem brain. And maybe some things are workable and allow us to do serious science. And it didn't took us too long to understand or to discover that certain molecules, such as messenger RNA molecules, are stable enough, even in postmortem brain, for at least a couple of hours after death, that they can be quantified in a scientific manner and be compared, in this case, between cases of schizophrenia and, and control. So, so back then, all this endeavor, it's, it's really an endeavor, started, as I said, 25 years ago, focusing on single messenger RNA mo molecules of just a handful of genes, and just in one, or at best, two dozen of brains, and it took like a tiny little postdoc, such as myself, two or three years to get these studies done. But we, we had kind of hypothesis-driven research. We said we focused on messenger RNAs, which we know from the animal experiment, are very heavily regulated by neuronal activity. So if there is really hypofunction of the prefrontal cortex in schizophrenia, as suggested by the imaging studies, we may see a molecular signature. And in fact, lo and behold, for some of these cases, for some of these brains, um, there was, a, in this case, a downregulation of some of these housekeeping genes that balance neuronal excitation and inhibition in the cortex. And this early work um, set the foundation for much more elegant work by others who uh, refined the excitation inhibition balance hypothesis, or the GABA dysfunction hypothesis of schizophrenia. But so for my point, I back then felt my job was done, kind of imported a new technology in the field, have shown the field that um, molecular studies are very, very possible in schizophrenia postmortem brain. I went on, did my psychiatry residency as Mass General, and then went back, and back then I said, okay, if we accept this dysregulated gene expression in brains of subjects with schizophrenia, we should study gene expression mechanisms as best as possible again in postmortem brain. Um, with technology available. And gene expression is broadly regulated by chromatin or this protein DNA meshwork inside each of our cells nuclei. So, so, so these genes, here's the DNA shown as this black line. It's, it's wrapped around these little balloons, blue balloons, which are histone proteins. And these histones have maybe up to 100 different types of chemical modifications, and they regulate the functional state of this chromatin or the expression activity of this gene. So we, back then we said, okay, this has been studied, these histone modifications have been studied in things, in simple model organisms, Drosophila, 
baker's yeast, maybe laboratory mouse, but not really in brain or let alone in brain of subjects with diagnosis of psychiatric disorder. But again, we said, okay, you know, we may in the beginning be exposed to some ridicule because people always doubt that if these things are measurable in post-mortem brain, but we have shown the field that they are and have published some early papers in 2007 back then, I believe, showing um, some evidence for dysregulation, dysregulated histomodifications at some of these uh, schizophrenia-sensitive genes and deepen the mechanistic understanding of how gene expression is dysregulated in these, in these brains. And I was extremely delighted that seven or eight years after we published this work, large-scale consortium with millions of dollars, like the Psychotic Genomics Consortium, who did genome-wide association studies on many, many tens of thousands of subjects, came out with a paper saying that psychotic genome-wide association studies analysis implicates neuronal, immune, and histone pathways as being a major driver of the genetic risk architecture of schizophrenia, and I felt very pleased by that, saying, okay, we, get, we did again our job. We kind of imported a back then novel technology to the postmortem field and have shown that this can be developed in some tractable science. Good. So um, after this, so, so what I talk for the, what I speak about for the rest of my talk is our most recent attempts or tries or endeavors to push again the frontier in brain research by not understanding, in this case, the expression of single messenger RNA molecules or, or the biochemical composition of the system proteins, but rather the three-dimensional organization of the genome in each of our brain cells' nuclei, right? So it is, it is not a trivial problem. You have each human cell has six gigabases of DNA base pairs. So if you pull them out on a little thread, it's at least two or three meters long. And this two meter or three meter long DNA thread has to be packaged in each and, our, in each and every of our billions of brain cells into a tiny, tiny, tiny little cell nucleus just a few micrometers wide. So this is not a trivial issue, and it profoundly impacts the function and the biology of the genome, probably in a very setup specific manner. And over these 25 years where we did this work, um, technology, genome technology, genomic medicine has dramatically evolved. So back then, we studied, took us a couple of years to study a few single messenger RNA molecules. But now, if necessary, we are able to sequence the entire six gigabase of human genome, if necessary, if you have some money in hundreds of schizophrenia patients and controls, and if you get some money from NIH, even in as many specific brain cells from the brain. So this is a very, very amazing drive of the, of the technology since we started this. So what I, um, why this is more of academic interest is that one of the still unresolved mysteries of this already mentioned many times by me, uh, sorry if I'm a bit repetitive, right? So you have the six billion base pairs of human genome, 99 or 98% of this genome is encoding or is not encoding any protein. Any of our proteins which comprise our body are rely on this tiny 1.5% of DNA, right? So the question always was, what is this other 98.5% doing? And people thought it's some kind of, for many, many decades, carrier material or just some nonspecific stuff. But I, I will, there is a darning perception that much of this non-coding DNA is quite important for cell function. And from a bird's eye perspective, you could say all these chromosomes are probably superficially look like spaghetti stuffed in a cell nucleus. But in contrast to this pasta bowl, where the, I would hope so that this organization of the spaghetti is very random, not meaningful, um, that in our cells, each of our brain cells, on the other cells of the body, the configuration, this configuration of these chromosomes or pasta carries already information, which is not, so this is a different type of information than DNA base pair sequence. So we barely understand these mechanisms, and it's, it's a very new field, but this is what we're trying to understand, and we're trying to understand it in the context of uh, schizophrenia. So 
Basically, scientifically speaking, we're asking, can the study of chromosomal conformations enhance our understanding of the genetic and epigenetic risk architecture of schizophrenia? So this is the rest of my slides is still unpublished work, very innovative study, which is, um, emerged from a collaboration between my laboratory and Kristen Brennan Laboratories, who speaks also today, who is a colleague of mine at the Icahn School of Medicine. Kristen is a, STEM, a professor in stem cell biology, and we co some of our students are co-mentored, so they um, um, grow their cells in Kristen's lab and do this genome-wide chromosome conformation or three-dimensional genome assays in my lab. So um, one of these uh, students, Prashant Rajarajan, started with neuronal stem cells, differentiated them into neurons and astrocytes, and looked how these chromosomal conformation changed genome-wide. And this is just one arm of one chromosome, I think chromosome 17. It's a few megabases basis of genome with a few thousand genes. And you can see it doesn't, based on this genome browser views, doesn't take long to realize that this neuron here has a very different chromosomal conformation map as compared to the neuronal stem cells, which give birth to this neuron and to glial cells. So um, this is just in the interest of time. I'm not sure how much time I still have. Five minutes, so I'm kind of rushing, rushing a bit through this. And so, so what does this mean for schizophrenia? We have, by now, in this day and age, we have 145 loci um, genome-wide, shown here, which carry each individually a small risk factor of risk for schizophrenia heritability. And these loci are not really useful in genomic medicine yet because they cannot be, they're not very useful to predict in a specific patient the risk or the clinical cause of schizophrenia. So we thought what we can do, we can use these chromosome conformation assays to, um, I'm rushing a bit through the slides because I have only five minutes, but the principle is really here. So what we, what we did is we said, using our chromosomal confirmation assays, we're counting across each of these 145 risk loci in the genome, which carry some heritability risk for schizophrenia. We look for the connections, these chromosomal contacts of these risk loci to other portions of the genome who by themselves are not genetic risk factors. And by doing that, we expanded the list of genes which are associated with this genetic risk space from 204, 204 genes which are sitting inside these risk loci to a number like 240 plus 130, 227 to, so we added several hundred of genes across the genome that are by themselves not located within a DNA sequence that carries genetic risk, but which are by a chromosomal contact connected to that sequence. So we expanded the genomic risk space for schizophrenia, and that was important because by doing that, what we discovered is that there are certain types of gene groups, cell, cell adhesion molecules, vaulted, gated calcium channels, molecules very important for glutamatergic sig uh, signaling, glutamate receptor signaling, action potential, et cetera, et cetera, that are not by themselves carrying heritability for schizophrenia, but they are physically connected to schizophrenia risk loci, and the expression levels of these genes is highly co-regulated co with genes that are sitting within these risk loci. So we kind of, by this work, expanded the genomic risk space for schizophrenia, and um, what we hope to do with that is basically to, to refine certain concepts in the field of genetics, like polygenic risk score, which, which are Early, early attempts to use this information from these genome-wide association studies to better predict clinical parameters or risk for future schizophrenia development. And we're trying to add to this amount of information, informa we, we're trying to add, literally add genome sequence, other portions, we're trying to understand the portion of the genome that is connected to this risk loci and that has to be taken into the calculation when one um, if one tries to um, understand what part of the genomes contribute to this risk for developing this disorder. And with this, I'm finishing. So this is an acknowledgement slide from a talk that actually the, uh, one of the main actors in this project, Prashant Rajarajan, has generated. So his name is not on here. So typical professor taking and stealing the slides of my students. But again, as I mentioned, this is a, a collaborative uh, project between my laboratory and Kristen Brennan's lab and many other players um, who, uh, who have contributed. And 
I'm always, I'm, I'm with this, I'm finishing it. As I said yesterday at the dinner, I cannot emphasize it enough during all these 25 years. It's not an overstatement for each and every of these early stage pioneering projects, years before we got our first NIH grants to do this work, it was always NASA, it was always BBRF, who had in some ways by Young Investigator Award or Independent Investigator Award or at some point Distinguished Investigator Award put in this critical seed fund to push this frontier in human brain research. So I'm very grateful um, for that, over, for their continuous support, for your continuous support over the entire last 25 years. Thank you.